Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my talk today will be about uh, outpatient evaluation of children with uh, heart murmur. Um, I do not have any disclosures except that I stole this line from uh, Russell Cross from our group. Um, through my talk today, I would like to review the most common primary diagnosis seen at our institution, Children's National Medical Center Cardiology Department. Um, I plan to identify the characteristics of common innocent heart murmurs that we see, help you understand the features of pathological murmurs and help you send us more of those. And finally, when is it appropriate to send an asymptomatic child for us for an evaluation if you identify a heart murmur in them. Um, over one year period of time, between April of 2010 until March of this year, we saw around um, 8,000 patients as a new encounters. And as you can see, um, the most common diagnosis that we give to parents when they leave us is innocent heart murmurs. Um, in comparison, congenital heart disease was identified in around uh, 1,500 uh, cases. Over the same period of time, not necessarily the same patients, but the same period of time, we saw around 8,700 uh, patients in follow-up. Um, and although we saw more than half of those were related to congenital heart disease, we still saw 500 patients with innocent heart murmurs. Thank you. Uh, innocent murmurs are, you know, as you know, they are the sounds of the blood uh, going through the structurally normal heart. Uh, some papers suggested 70 to 90 percent of normal children at one point in their life will have an innocent heart murmur. On the other hand, congenital heart disease, uh, congenital heart disease is much rare. 0.8 uh, percent of the general population will have congenital heart disease. Um, for the, those of us cardiologists, we don't, we don't categorize mitral valve prolapse or bicuspid aortic valve as part of congenital heart disease. Community-based studies suggested anywhere between 2 to 2 4 percent uh, prevalence of these two conditions. If they are associated with stenosis or regurgitation, they can lead to heart murmurs. And acquired heart disease, rheumatic fever, infective endocarditis is also very rare, and they can lead to heart murmurs. When you evaluate such patients, it's important to know the age at which they present. Um, generally speaking, the murmurs that you will pick up in the newborn period will be more likely related to a semilunar valve stenosis or overflow over that valve. Ductal dependent lesions usually happen at the time of the ductus arteriosus closing, anywhere between one to two weeks of life. And then the ventricular septal defect, large VSD, usually they start presenting when the pulmonary vascular resistance drop uh, around four weeks of age. This can be delayed in children with Down syndrome. It's important to review the history of the pregnancy if you are dealing with a child in the newborn period. Um, gestational diabetes can lead to uh, hypertrophy of the muscles, where as uh, women with a true diabetes, uh, the, the congenital heart disease in the form of tetralogy can happen in those children. Robella can lead to pathological pulmonary stenosis. And in a very recent paper in March of 2011, smoking um, was associated with specific congenital heart disease. We have been blaming smoking for small for gestational age, and this uh, paper was based on the Washington Baltimore Infant Study. Um, pulmonary valve stenosis, ill transposition was seen more frequently uh, in, pair, uh, in children of mothers who smoked throughout pregnancy. The talk will be case-based. I have only 25 minutes to go. I will give you a few seconds at the end of the case to think of what would you do in your own practice. We don't have audience evoked responses, so just for your own knowledge. This is our first patient. By the way, all of them are uh, cases that we saw uh, referred by one of you guys. Three week old noted to have a heart murmur during a will child visit. Uh, the history suggested that there was no difficulty in breathing, no excessive sweating or cyanosis, and the child finishes the three ounces uh, of semilac every two hours with no difficulties. This is his physical examination. He was plotted on the 50th percentile for weight. His pulse was normal at 146, normal blood pressure, and he had a normal S1, S2 with an ejection systolic murmur grade 2 over 6 radiating to the back. The murmur was best here at the left upper sternal border. There was no hepatomegaly and he had very good pulses. Just a reminder, those are the four areas where the, we hear the heart sounds. Um, the left upper sternal border is usually the pulmonary valvular area. I put this slide up here just to remind you of the grading of the uh, heart murmurs. Uh, I asked a medical student once and he said, uh, if I hear it, it's at least a grade three. Um, so 
the biggest difference is between grade three and four. If you feel a thrill, you, then you are dealing with four and above. Uh, most of the, th uh, of the time we end up picking two to uh, four. It's very rare to hear five or six. This is what we mean by an ejection systolic murmur. It's a crescendo, decrescendo uh, uh, type of murmur. The biggest difference is that there will be a gap between the closure of uh, the AV valve and the beginning of the systolic murmur. It can be heard in cases of stenosis of the valve or an overflow or over uh, too much blood flow over a normal valve. The case that I presented to you had an echocardiogram which showed bilateral pulmonary artery branch, branch stenosis, patent foramen ovale, and no valvular uh, stenosis. Um, what we mean by pulmonary flow murmur of infancy, in the Midwest we used to call this as a peripheral pulmonary stenosis. Now that I moved to the East Coast, I'm referring to it as pulmonary artery branch stenosis. It's the same phenomena. Uh, there are many theories to why it happens. Uh, in the infant uh, life, we only send 10% of our cardiac output to the lungs. Once the child is born, that patient, that child needs to send 50%. Relatively speaking, the pulmonary arteries are still small. Also, the angle at which the pulmonary artery branches is different in the newborn, and it improves with time. Usually, this kind of murmur disappears. That being said, there is also a similar entity in, adult, in childhood um, between ages of 8 to 14 years of age. It's still innocent. There is no clicks or thrills, and it follows the same rules about flow murmurs. So going back to this patient, um, this is a healthy newborn whose history was uh, b very benign. He had a very short systolic murmur that radiated to the back, best here at the left upper sternal border. The question here is, would you have sent this patient to me? Are you at fault for not sending this patient? Um, and in a, to answer that question, I just want to go over the differential diagnosis. What could this be? It, it's either going to be a valvular stenosis, and because of the grade of the murmur, it's going to be a mild form or it's an overflow over that murmur, whether it is a small atrial septal defectory, fancy schmancy, pulmonary uh, vein, partial pulmonary vein uh, anomaly. That, what I'm trying to get at here is, if you hold off sending this patient until the kid is six months of age or one year of age, you will get rid of the paths because most likely they will improve. And then you will end up sending us those with a small atrial septal defect and mild pulmonary stenosis. Identifying such lesions at one year of age is absolutely not harmful because none of us will intervene on these conditions less than one year of age. As a matter of fact, we will just ask the patient to come back and follow up. So I know that many of you call me and ask me questions. And I hear this, do you need me to send this case? Or I get parents to say, and this murmur was picked up at birth. My pediatrician has been following this up. It persisted, and that's why we are here. And that's absolutely appropriate. This is our second case. This is a four-year-old with a new onset heart murmur. Now, as you listen to this, you will hear the heart sound, and then you will hear the child breathing. Okay, I'll play it one more time. And then you ask the kid to stand up and again focus on the heart sound. Their child will be breathing, but that's the reality of things, that they do breathe when we listen to them. So I hope that you would agree with me that the heart murmur decreased when the child uh, stood up. This is what we refer to as a stills murmur. Dr. Uh, George Still from Oxford in 1909 described it. He uh, appropriately identified it as not part of endocarditis or any other pathology. He said it was a musical and he didn't know why it happened, but it is functional and it does not need any further workup. Um, it's the most common innocent heart murmurs that we hear. Uh, the typical age is a three to six years of age. We can hear it until adolescent and it decreases with sitting up. Um, it's mid-systolic, low frequency, vibratory in nature. Our third case is a two-month-old girl who was noted to have a heart murmur at birth. Uh, her mother mentioned no history of difficulty in breathing, cyanosis or loss of consciousness. She eats nicely, finishes her four ounces every three hours in 10 minutes with no difficulties in breathing. Her examination uh, is shown. She was plotted at the, third and, uh, at the second and third percentile for weight and height. Uh, her blood pressure was normal. Her pulse rate was actually at the upper limit of normal. And she had a harsh ejection systolic murmur grade, four out of six at the right upper sternal border. And she also had a separate different heart murmur on the left upper sternal border, grade three out of six, that radiated to the back. Um, as you are leaving the room, the mother picks up a note and shows you the discharge Summary. On the discharge summary, uh, an echocardiogram was done at birth and it showed a patent for amino valley. 
So the question here is, if you were seeing this kid, what would you do? So there is a mismatch between what the echo report suggested and what the physical examination is. Patent foramen ovale is silent. The heart murmur that this kid had is out of proportion. So appropriately, one of you guys sent this, this patient. And this is what he had. This is an echocardiogram uh, that was done. Uh, I want you to focus on the aortic valve. Um, it's very thick. The area above it is very dysplastic. You just have to believe me. It's more like science fiction. Um, as this is playing, you will see that the aortic valve is just uh, thick, does not open. It's attached to the area above it, and the area above it is also narrowed. When we place our color on, the color accelerates. Now, for those of us who are in radiology or in cardiology, you would see that we are putting this at a very high scale, and still there is aliasing. This patient was taken to the cath lab, and for those of you recertifying in pediatrics, thanks to Crick Sable, you will see these diagrams in your boards. Um, so, in a normal open uh, outflow, there should be no pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the ascending aorta. In this patient, there is a 100 millimeter mercury difference. Same phenomena on the pulmonary area. 80, uh, there should be no difference between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery, and in this case, there was. So this patient has both supravalvular aortic stenosis, valvular and supravalvular pulmonary stenosis. And I know since the next talk is genetics, I will assure you that Williams syndrome was checked and it was negative. This kid didn't have it. So this patient had a surgical repair of both legions. She's now two years of age and she's doing very well. Her growth percentile had improved with time. This is my take home message or first take home message today. Uh, my second case is a, an eight year old girl who had a new onset heart murmur. Um, she was noted also to have elevated blood pressure for the last few months. Her mother, uh, who accompanied her today, noted while she's asleep, she will come here in the middle of the night and she will note that her heart rate is up. She was placed on Focalin uh, a year ago. Her examination showed the elevated heart rate, blood pressure, and she had the new onset heart murmur that was pansystolic, grade two, grade three out of six, uh, left lower sternal border radiating to the apex. Her EKG suggested left ventricular hypertrophy and her echocardiogram showed mild to moderate mitral valve regurgitation with some ventricular enlargement. So to summarize, this is an eight-year-old who has a new onset hypertension, sinus tachycardia out of proportion to the focalin, and a new mitral valve regurgitation. The question to you is how would you put all of this together? The, the published micromedics uh, numbers for focalin induced tachycardia is actually not as high as this kid had. So we did thyroid function test on this one and she had hyperthyroidism, but your thought is absolutely correct. So this kid was diagnosed with hyperthyroidism and she was started on methamazole. Uh, her, she was seen a year later and her degree of tachycardia, high blood pressure, and amount of mitral valve regurgitation improved with therapy. My, five, my fifth case of the day, which will be the last case of the day, um, is a 12-year-old who was referred for a heart murmur. This murmur was picked up when the child had an appendicitis. Um, normal heart rate, normal blood pressure, and a pansystolic murmur grade 2 over 6. I know that some of you have EKG in your office, so look at this EKG for one second and try to identify the abnormality. One second. Um, so this patient has pre-excitation. You don't see it nicely in lead one, two, uh, and many of the other leads, but you do see it in V1, V2, and V4. Uh, it has to do with the, where the site of this accessory pathway is. So how can you combine both uh, the presence of Paul Parkinson White with the pansystolic murmur that we hear? So this patient uh, has what we call Epstein's anomaly. Uh, this is the normal heart. The right atria is attached to the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. The left atria attached to the left ventricle through the mitral valve. As this is playing, you will see that those two valves are at the same uh, level, whereas in our patient, they are displaced. The tricuspid valve is displaced towards the apex. This is a condition of Epstein's anomaly, which is associated with uh, with Parkinson White and EKG. Um, there are papers that suggested the use of EKG did not enhance the cardiologist's decision on when to do an echocardiogram. And this is not antagonist to that. The reality of thing is that if you send us a pansystolic murmur, we will echo those cases. So it's nice to know that there is some associations with EKG abnormalities, but in this particular case, it would not have 
it, it, it didn't change our management decision. So in summary, what defines an innocent heart murmur? As innocent murmur is systolic, apart from a venous hum. It, is, it affects a small area. It's very soft and short. And it's single. There is usually no clicks or gallops associated with it. It's very sweet, never harsh. And it's very sensitive to the change in posture. So when should you refer me an asymptomatic patient with a heart murmur when it is not innocent? So <laughs> in other words, if you have a diastolic or continuous murmur apart from the venous hum, which is usually just below the clavicles, if it's maximally heard at any site except the left upper sternal border, if it is harsh, if it is long, if it's associated with the clicks or gallops, and then I used to say if it does not change with posture, the reality of thing is you, know, you don't want it to be aggravated with posture. So I specifically mentioning here, do not decrease upon standing. If you do send us such patients, I will truly appreciate it. Some of you do this. Send us a note on your prescription pad, just what kind of heart murmur did you hear and where did you hear it? Um, we're only a phone call away. Please call us if you have any questions. If our report does not match your physical examination, that's a red flag, call us. These are some uh, of the resources available for you and for the families. Uh, Dr. Mark Wiseman asked me to put this up uh, as resources for you and the patients. Craig Sable from our own group put or revamped the whole website for the American Heart Association. It's really nice when I visit nurseries outside, I go to this wipes to print out pictures related to congenital heart disease. They are very good. There is video animation of that as well. Um, our own children's website, we, have, we do have conditions and treatments. Uh, we don't have any pictures yet, but they are all uh, educational material for the families. It's just Word document. These two textbooks, I really like them. One of them is from Mayo Clinic, David Druskell, who is a mentor for many pediatric cardiologists. And this one here is where I got the heart sounds from. Uh, it's a very nice uh, book that has a CD with it. Uh, you will, it has both um, lying down and standing up what happened to the heart murmur and the four sites. Uh, of uh, the chest. I will stop here. If you have any questions, please. <laughs>